folks. It's good to be here. Good to be here. Amen. Good to have Sister Valance with us this morning. She's been through a, an ordeal, let's put it that way. Father, Lord, give me, give me the gift of teaching now. I give the folks ears they're able to hear. And then a heart that Heavenly Father desires to know and to receive the truth. In thy name I pray. Amen. All right, we're going to pick up today the second lesson on the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about the dove and sending forth the dove from the ark and how the dove is a type of uh, the Holy Spirit. And um, showed you, we talked about that at length. And this morning I'm going to deal with the Holy Spirit as the seal, a seal. Now, uh, in the in ancient time, the seal is very important as it is as much as it is today. The king wore normally wore a signet or a ring, and uh, he would impress in a piece of clay that ring. And when he did, that gave the seal the the king's signatures called a bulla. They can find these today. Archaeologists have many of them that are uh, intact that were used to seal documents and various other things. And if you broke that seal, you'd break it at the pain of your own life because uh, that seal represented the authority and power of the king. So he would impress in that bula or in that clay, that soft clay, the material, the seal. So the seal, therefore, becomes a picture of the Lord Jesus, a type of the Holy Spirit, where, where uh, he sealed Christ. Look at John chapter number 6 and verse 27. John 6, 27. John chapter number 6 and verse number 27. The, uh, the Lord said, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now this sealing where God sealed his Son was, uh, was a mark placed upon him that this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When he was baptized the Jordan River and the dove came down, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came down, this was God sealing his son, marking him off as one that belongs to him. And when you and I are born again and receive the Holy Spirit by the new birth, that immediately becomes a seal in the presence of God for us. And it also becomes a measure of where we know one another because we know each other by the Spirit, not by the flesh. And uh, the Spirit is all important, all important. The reason that people go wrong and they go bad is because they get with the wrong crowd and pick up their spirit. The thing about spirits, if you uh, have any experience with it or study it, you'll find that spirits are very contagious, very contagious. And the spirit is all important before, because it dictates how your flesh, how your body uh, reacts and how it lives. For example, uh, just a, a few nights ago, this past Friday night, in uh, Manchester, Tennessee, how many know where Manchester is located? Well, folks, there's 80,000 people down there right now. 80,000 people in Manchester. That's a huge number of people. I've been to Manchester. It's this nice little town down there. They've got a beautiful clock shop. If you like clocks, you ought to go in sometime. Check out their clock shop. You say, well, what's this 80,000 people? It's a recreation of Woodstock. That's what it is. It's a recreation of Woodstock. It's called Bonnaroo. But now they reached a milestone this past Friday night. Paul McCartney was there. And if you know who he is, he's one of the Beatles and uh, one, of the, one of the four that showed up in America in the early 60s. See, I was in the generation that grew up with all of that. I remember all of that. 
I remember it firsthand. But in any event, Paul McCartney was up singing and talking to the crowd and, and, you know, talking about how much he enjoyed being there and everything. And he made this statement. He said, I can smell some good weed. See? Now, if you know, you know, to me that means marijuana. And the writer of the article talked about the, the, uh, the smoke, puffs of smoke rising up from all around. And apparently, uh, Mr. McCartney has enough experience to where he can tell the difference by smelling good weed from bad weed. You know. That's right. yeah, apparently. But here's the thing. There is one spirit that, gener that uh, energizes those people. One spirit. All right. Well, I don't smell any weed, but I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And that makes all the difference in the world. Right. So, Mr. McCartney... I think he's 70, 71 years old, 71, 72, somewhere in there. He's a little older than me. Mr. Car Mr. McCartney is smelling weed, and I'm feeling the Holy Spirit. That's a big difference, isn't it? And we both started the same, because in 1964, when he came over here, I want to hold your hand, and all the rest of that uh, song, they called it the British Invasion when they came into America, the Beatles. The first thing I remember, the, the thing that impressed me so much about them, everybody was talking about their hair in the, 19, in the early 60s, the Beatles. Because if you look at the old newsreel, and you'll see their hair is a little long and different. In today's standards, it's nothing. Yeah. See, but back then it was a big deal. That's how much things have changed. So the spirit's everything. And uh, everything in the world's going on at Bonnaroo. And somebody's making a pile of money at Bonnaroo. And I'll bet you, to, I'll, I'd say to you this morning that the people of Manchester, Tennessee are probably getting real tired of Bonnaroo. And uh, that highway that leads into this place is loaded with traffic. 80,000 people coming and going. And what all needs to be done to, to just take care of 80,000 people, folks, is an enormous thing. You go to the football game over here at UT, and they've got 110, 100,000 plus. I don't know what it is exactly. And look at all the people, the traffic on the interstate. You know, the people trying to get there, and they're trying to get away from there. So uh, you get an idea of what's going on. Spirit's everything. And when they said, uh, let's call fire down from heaven and destroy these people who aren't with you, Lord, he said, you know not what spirit you're of. So the spirit is what energizes you. The Holy Spirit, therefore, is in Scripture uh, pictured as a seal, as he seals. And it is God the Father he, who does the sealing. In Ephesians chapter number 1 and uh, verse number 11, <coughs> chapter 1 and verse number 13, Ephesians, some books uh, are dominant dominated by certain themes the book of ephesians is definitely dominated by the idea of the spirit ephesians chapter number one verse 13 in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that holy spirit of promise you see that all right, now, if you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus, been born again, why in the world would you want God to give you the Holy Spirit? You see what I mean? You'd want Him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. You, you'd want the power of the Holy Spirit. But for you to ask for God to give you the Holy Spirit after you're born again is to look back up at God and say, well, you know, Lord, I know what your word says, but that's meaningless. I need the Holy Spirit. Well, we need the Holy Spirit in power. We certainly do. But if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. You can't be a real believer in the Lord Jesus, born again without the Holy Ghost. And here it is plain that He sealed you with the Holy Spirit of God. Now the sealing, of course, here is marking and for a lot of other reasons, which we'll deal with later. In, uh, but of course, I want you to understand it's very important to know that He sealed you with that Holy Spirit. And that means that you belong to Him. Look at John chapter number 14, verse 17. John 14, 17.
Now, we've got a lot of good Pentecostal brethren out here, and they mean well. But sometimes they get a little bit scary in some of the things they get off into. And uh, John chapter number 14 and verse number 17, the Bible said, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. An unsaved man has no capacity to have the Holy Spirit, for there is nowhere for the Holy Spirit to reside in an unbeliever. You must be born again of the Spirit of God in order for the Holy Spirit to reside in you, for there's nowhere for Him to reside. It's, for example, you can only come into this building and sit in this building because this building is here. And the reason you can come in is because it's available. You have a place you can come to. But an unsaved man is like you coming out into a field to sit down in a building and there's no building there. The unsaved man has nowhere for the Holy Spirit to come to. But if you're born again, been born of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit takes up His dwelling in your spirit, in your spirit, which has been born anew of God, literally born of God. And that's why the world cannot receive Him. They can receive teaching and they can receive religion and they can receive moral instruction and all that, but they cannot receive the Holy Spirit. It's utterly impossible. You can't do it. There's nowhere for Him to reside. So this is why in the Old Testament, one of the reasons, for example, David said, Lord, take not thine Holy Spirit from me. He was in fear that the Holy Spirit would be taken from him. Was this fear genuine? Absolutely. Was it based on reality? Absolutely. Could it have happened? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, why? David's the king. Yes, but David wasn't born again. Nobody could be born again until Christ died on the cross and ratified, in other words, brought into validity, into reality, the new covenant, the new testament. And the new testament is in his blood. It could not happen. It could not happen. The Lord Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the door that is the, is the death that opened the door and made it possible for an unsaved man to be born of the Spirit of God. And Colossians 2 says plainly that you've been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of this death. Well, the putting off of the body of the death is directly related with the new birth because the new birth separates body, soul, and spirit. And the body is no longer connected with the soul like it is in the Old Testament. That's why in the Old Testament so many times the soul and the body are spoken of synonymously. There's no real differenti differentiation made between the two. And the reason for that is because they are essentially the same. And, uh, and the reason for that is because there's no new birth. It's, it's, it's a soulish thing in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and everything changes from soulish to spirit in the New Testament. And uh, so uh, if you don't see that, if you don't, if, you don't, if you don't accept the teaching that the spirit in the Old Testament was entirely different in his relationship with men as it is in the New Testament, then it op opens up the door for all kinds of confusion when you try to make everything the same from Genesis to Revelation, you get in all kinds of trouble. So, sealed. Uh, John chapter number 14, the world cannot receive, even if they wanted to, which they don't. Simon Magnus would want the power of the Holy Spirit to sell and profit from, but he would not want the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit came into this world, he came into this world, the first one he came on in unction and anointing, unlike anyone else, is Christ at the Jordan River. And he came down in the form of a dove. And God anointed Christ, as I said to you last Sunday morning, he anointed him, as it says in the book of Acts, with the Holy Spirit. And this anointing was necessary. <clears throat> Don't ever think that it is an automatic thing that just because God's called you to do something that you've been anointed to do it. Don't think so. Not at all. The anointing is something that you receive from the Lord when you're ready to receive it. And this anointing is altogether necessary. On this point, our Pentecostal brethren are right. And the Baptists don't put near an, as much emphasis on it as they should. The Pentecostals talk about over and over and over again how that you need to be anointed. You need to be anointed. You need to be anointed. 
and which I fully agree with because you can't do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the anointing of God. And it is not an automatic thing. So the Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He makes no mistake when he does it. In, John, in Romans 8, verse 15, Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 15, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's the spirit that the writer of Hebrews, Paul, talks about so many times. Because of that, in the Old Testament, they were in bondage because they were in fear of death. That's bondage. That's fear of death. They thought, and they never had a clear conscience. And the reason for that is because the sin debt had not been paid. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. It can't take away the guilt of sin. It can't take away the condemnation of sin. It can't take away any of that. So the Bible said when Christ died, he died for the transgressions before the law. You see, for the redemption of transgressions before the law, before the testament, before the blood atonement. He died for them too. So here we have in, John, in Romans 8, in verse number 15, Ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you have received capital S-P-I-R-T of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now the word translated spirit here is pneuma, and I'm sure you've heard that many times. A pneumatic drill is an air drill. Pneuma, pneumatos is the de declining of the noun. Uh, so we have uh, in verse number 15, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We don't cry, Abba, Father, enough because he's not that he, he's a father intellectually to us, but not in reality to us. The work of the Holy Spirit is to make God your father. The work of the Holy Spirit is to make him your father. God will never become your father until he, until he becomes your Lord God Almighty Master. Until you yield to him, regardless of the circumstances, what happens in life, what comes, what goes. Until you yield to him until you yield to him and say, Lord, you're my God and you're my Father, regardless whether I understand it, can work it out, whether I like it or don't like it, you're my Father. Then the fatherhood of God becomes a reality to you. Once the fatherhood of God becomes a reality to you, there is a distinct identity in each person of the Godhead. There's only one God, but each one of them have their own identity. Now, there's no question about that because the Son of God being your Savior is the one you cry out to throughout the day. Lord, I'm, save me. Help me through this situation. Save me. And the salvation comes through the Son who presents you to the Father. But he wants the Father to be your Father. This is when you, become, when you cry, Abba, Father. That's a term, endearing term of a child. Because a child can say, Abba, 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 Father. And so here he is as our father. And most of the people that I've known, my reality has been this in Christian life, in the Christian world. In 30, this, this coming August, in 37 years of pastoring a Baptist church, my reality has been this. The vast majority of the Baptists that I've known, they want a Savior. And oh, yes, they want a Savior, but they don't want a father. They don't want a father. They don't want a father. And, uh, you know, I mean, it is coincidental that this is Father's Day. I hadn't thought about that when I was talking about this. It is Father's Day. The greatest father you could have is God the Father. Amen. And for those of you that have never had an earthly father in Mount Hill of Beans, which I didn't, you can have a father who will begin to reveal himself to you as a father. And God, that's what God's done for me, reveal himself in that sense. I've known him as my Savior since 1973, saved me from a devil's hell who I deserved. But it's only as he begins to work deeper in your life, deeper in your life, deeper in your life, if you'll, if you'll let him come through the door that he knocks on, he'll come in deeper. And the more he reveals himself to you, the more he'll reveal himself to you as your father. And you need a father. So the... Uh, Romans chapter number 8 and verse 15, we cry of a father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If you look over here in 1 John 4 verse 17, written by the same apostle, 
I mean, written, this one is written by John. In John chapter number 4, verse number 17, 1 John 4, 17, Look carefully at this now. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, that is right now, so are we in this world, in this present evil world, in this life. As he is there, we are here. Now let me give you a, caution, a precaution. I've observed this. Uh, there's a lot of people that put an awful lot of emphasis upon the suffering of Christ. There are those that put, don't put enough on it. There's extremes in both directions. When this movie came out, The Passion of Christ, uh, immediately they started lining up on either side. One got on this side, the other got on that side. Hollywood has never produced a movie. Never produced a movie. Never produced a movie that came anywhere near depicting the reality of, a, of the uh, scourging that Christ received and the crucifixion. Amen. I'll stand by that until I'm gone from this earth. Amen. Nowhere near, nowhere near. It was a bloody spectacle. And I don't know how many of you saw it, but uh, I got the DVD. And I've seen that movie five, six, seven, eight, nine times. I don't know how many. And uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. And every time I watch it, I am definitely impressed with the fact that I believe it depicts the reality of what happened. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ was scourged and his bones showed. I believe he was beaten to a pulp. I believe, it, I believe his flesh hung in shreds from his back. I believe Pontius Pilate did that so he could appease the blood, blood thirst and blood lust of those Jews hoping that when he brought him back out there, bleeding like that, and said, Behold the man. The Latin for it is echo homo. And he stood up there before them and he said, Behold the man. Now look at him. Isn't this enough? That's the idea. Hoping that after he had scourged him, that they would be satisfied and let him loose. But no, no, no. They wanted him dead. They wanted him crucified. Crucify him, they said. They screamed it. And so... Against Pilate's better judgment and his will, he washed his hands and said, My hands are free of the blood, the guilt of this just man. Enough of you, Jews. You take him out and you, you crucify him. And so they did. Of course, the Jew himself didn't nail him to the tree, but he was, he was the one who did it. Uh, but here's the bottom line. I heard a lot of hee-hawing, a lot of hem-hawing, a, a, a lot of criticism from a lot of brethren I got on the internet and did some searching into it, and I mean, I'm telling you right now, some of these guys got real, real uh, rancid in some of the things that they said, and said that's nothing more than a Roman Catholic Stations of the Cross, and that's all it is, and uh, you can see the Station of the Cross here, and the Station of the Cross there, and Veronica over here, and wiping the blood here, and this and that, and this and that, and this and that. They reduced it to nothing in the world more than a Roman Catholic spectacle. Yeah, they did. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. And by doing that, of course, it was, they became very highly critical and judgmental of the whole thing. Now, Tommy Tillman's uh, son had taken I don't know how many people to see it and how many of them got saved by watching it. All across the country, people were confessing their sins and getting right with God, leaving the theater under enormous conviction. And uh, some people just can't stand the thought that God could be in something like that because it didn't come out of a fundamental Baptist camp. Okay? But here, here's, here's the point in all of this. There are those that go to the extreme one way and say, we need to suffer like Christ did. We need to shed blood like Christ did. We need to identify with the suffering. Our life should be tied up day in and day out with suffering. Suffering, suffering, suffering. We need to suffer. We need to suffer. We need to suffer. There are those who take the extreme in the other direction and say, Christ has died and given us abundant life. We should be living the life of Riley on this earth, enjoying all the things that God's done for us. And uh, he's paid the sin debt, you know, and it's all by grace now. Hallelujah, glory to God. Let's just go out and eat, drink, and be merry, for we're going to heaven when we die. You think I'm kidding you? 
I went to the Holy Land. I've been there six times. One time I went, I, we stayed at the hotel, which is right across from the, Kid, it's right across from the Kidron Valley. All right, the Kidron Valley. We stayed there. The last night, the last time I slept in a room in the Kidron, right above the Kidron Valley, right above it, the last night I, I slept in that room, I didn't sleep. I wrestled all night long with an evil spirit that was trying to kill me. That was when I came back and God met me on that back porch up there and I had an encounter with God. I had an encounter with God on that back porch. But that thing met me at, Kidron, at the Kidron Valley. That evil spirit did when I was in the Holy Land. It's just as real to me as I'm standing before you this morning. But anyway, when we got to that hotel, it's called the Five Arches, the Five Arches Hotel. Various groups stay there. Different groups stay in that hotel. And we got in there, and uh, I have to confess, I have to confess, God knows I'm just the way I am. I see about everything. <laughs> Used to, I saw everything. I don't see quite as much today as I did then, but I was walking by the bar. And they've got a bar there because they have everybody there. And here sits this Christian group, this Christian group, and here they are right back with their, with their, with their glasses of suds. With a head on it, you know. I mean, just having a big old drinking time. And I thought to myself, you know, even if you think that's okay, here's what, here's what I thought. Even if you think it's okay for you to guzzle beer down, couldn't you take a break here at the Kidron Valley, right above Gethsemane? Gethsemane is, is within a stone's throw of where we were staying. Gethsemane is right across the Kidron Valley. How many of you know Gethsemane, what I'm talking about? You can stand at Gethsemane and look up and see the Eastern Gate. But they couldn't take a break from their beer. Now that's the extreme in the other direction, okay? Both ways. You've got to find a balance in there somewhere. I don't belong to this crowd that thinks I have to flagellate myself and suffer and persecute myself and bleed and all of that, but I sure don't belong to that crowd either sitting over there soaking up their suds. You see what I mean? You've got to have conviction yourself about where you, what you believe and where you believe and, what you, and, and where you stand. This is something that comes to you. I don't have liberty to do that. I don't have liberty to drink and I don't have liberty to beat myself. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to find my way. I'm going to find the way God has laid out for me in this world. Amen. And that's what we're talking about here. That's what he's talking about. As Christ is, so are we in this world. Well, he is not there now. He's not bleeding. He's not suffering. He's not dying. See, all these independent Baptists that blasted the passion of Christ don't get, don't get, what was his word? He played a little play on words. A little, little, uh, don't get passionate about the passion of Christ. That's what one said. Real cute, the way he put it together. You know, don't get passionate about the passion of Christ. Now, I got a lot of criticism about that. But I'll tell you right now, if you watch that movie, and you watch what uh, the Lord went through, and forget the fa and, and if you've never been through the Stations of the Cross, how many of you know what the Stations of the Cross are? There's 12 of them. I've been in Roman Catholic, I think 12. I've been in Roman Catholic churches. I go into their chapels. You're liable to find me anywhere. <laughs> I go in there and I look at this stuff. I look at this, I look at this, I look at this, I look at this. Each one of these Stations of the Cross represents a place that st he stopped had something to do with the Via Doloroso, the way of suffering that led him from Pilate's judgment hall to the cross at Calvary. That's what I understand it to mean. But if you're not a Roman Catholic indoctrinated in Roman Catholic doctrine, it'll fly by you like you didn't have any clue. You don't even know what's going on. You're not going to recognize a station of the cross. You don't even know they existed. In one part of the movie, she reaches down and she takes the blood that shed that falls from the face of Christ, a woman does, and she puts it in a garment and pulls it up next to her. Well, in, in, in tradition, that's supposed to be Veronica. How many of you ever heard of Veronica? See, few of you have. Most of you haven't. So what did you miss? You didn't miss anything. But what you did see was a physical depiction of what happened 2,000 years ago. And one of the reasons that I have trouble with a lot of independent fundamental Baptists, and I got trouble with a lot of them, is because if they don't hammer it out on their anvil, if, they don't, if it's not part of their group and their clique, 
then it's not right. And I'm afraid they're going to find out at the judgment seat of Christ that there's a whole lot of believers up there that lived in different cultures and different times than they did. So what am I? I'm a Christian, and I'm a Bible-believing Christian. That's what I am. That's what I am. I believe the Bible. And when somebody can show me something in this book right here, in this Bible, that where I'm wrong in what I believe, I'm going to take the book every time. Every time I'm going to take it in a heartbeat over what I believe. I'm not tied to anybody's school. I'm not tied to anybody's fellowship. I'm not tied to anybody's group of preachers. Just my Lord God Almighty and this Holy Bible. That's it. And that's good enough for me. And that's the way it'll be until I'm gone from this old world. Is the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God? As He is, so are we in the world. Is He the Son of God? We are sons of God. Is He beloved of God? So are we. Is He the righteous one? So are we in Him. Is He without spot? So are we in Him. Did He die on the cross? So did we in Him. Is He raised from the dead? So are we in Him. Is He accepted of God? So are we in Him. He's the pre Is He the Holy One? So are we in Him. Is He anointed? Is He the anointed of God? So are we. And you know, I've said, to this, said it to you before, but it bears repeating that all of these things in the Old Testament become a person in the New. <laughs> Holiness, righteousness, justification, redemption, uh, propitiation, and all of that. Christ is our propitiation. He's our justification. He's our holiness. All of these things now are personified in a person in the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course they have to be because all of that stuff in the Old Testament was a type and a shadow of the reality. Even the temple that was built, the temple that, they, that Solomon built, the tabernacle that was pitched in the wilderness, it says plainly in the book of Hebrews that these were a picture or a type or a shadow of the real tabernacle, the real temple that's in heaven and not on this earth. And so all of that changes. What does the seal imply? It implies that, that a finished tra transaction has taken place. Uh, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 32, verse 10. Look at verse, 10, verse 9. I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in an Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open. This is a legal transaction that took place. And the seal was necessary for the legal transaction to take place. The seal, therefore, becomes a legal binding document. And that is what's going on when God saved you. That means something legal has taken place. I am no longer owned by Satan. I'm owned by the Lord. And God held, and God held court in his court of law, and he sealed me. And when I left that court of law, I belong to him, and I don't belong to the devil. I used to belong to the devil, lock, stock, and barrel, Amen. but I don't anymore. I belong to the Lord. Why? Because he sealed me with the Holy Spirit. Now, the seal, therefore, represents a finished transaction. But when he seals you, he seals you for security also to keep you. When you close up something and put a seal on it, like, for example, when they put the Lord inside the tomb and rolled a stone in front of it and they sealed him, what was the purpose of that? Well, they didn't want anybody to steal his body. Did he rise from the dead? Could their seal stop? No, their seal. Man's seal could not stop that. Man, man could no longer control that. Then he could rise from the dead himself. So the seal, therefore, represents the authority of the one who does the sealing. Well, man has no authority over God. God has authority over man. And so they set a seal, the Bible says, on the tomb. But the seal couldn't hold him because man can't hold him. The grave couldn't hold him. 
in, uh, in verse number, uh, John chapter number uh, 17 and verse 9, I want you to look at this little bit of a twist on this that I'm talking about. John chapter 17, verse 9. I want you to go back and look at verse number 8 and look at the context. He said, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Now look at verse 8. Which thou gavest me. Verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. God seals them, gives them to the Son. The Son keeps them and presents them to the Father. That's what's going on. One day, the Son will present us to the Father. <laughs> yeah. And let me give you a little bit of a warning, though it's all absolutely impossible. Let me give you a little bit of a warning. Don't try to sneak in any other way. <laughs> And say, well, I know where God is. I know I can find him. My religion is as good as yours. No, I'm sorry. Uh, well, truth, yeah, I agree with you. Your religion is just as good as my religion or anybody else's religion. If it was just about religion, why, well, it's meaningless. But my God, <laughs> the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, my God is the only God there is. That's what brings wrath down on your head. That's right. That's what brings it down on your head. When you tell them there's just one God, and that God can only be approached through one Son. And that Son will present us to the Father one day. And the Father gave Him us to begin with. <laughs> Every one of us who are born again in this house, we were given to the Son from the Father. And now the, and now the Son gives us back to the Father. And this, of course, agrees with the Scripture, which it says, No man knows the Father but the Son, no man knows the Son but the Father, and whomsoever he shall present him to or bring him to. In other words, a reciprocation there. I can't know the Father without the Son. I can't know the Son without the Father. Reciprocation. And you can't. You can't. So there are those who say they love Jesus and they know Jesus and that Jesus is their Lord, and yet they say, well, it doesn't really matter which God is your God. Jesus is my God, you know. Or you, your God may be Buddha, or your God may be Confucius, or your God may be, uh, you may, you may be, uh, uh, your God may be a, one of the millions of Hindu gods, or what? It make any difference? We're all going the same way. Jesus, I love Jesus. That's my faith tradition. Blah 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 blah. I'm sorry. Why? Because the Father didn't give you to Jesus, and this Jesus you have will not give you to the Father, because you don't know the Father. In other words, if you don't know. If you don't know who the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the reason I say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is because that's the God of the Old Testament Hebrew. If you don't know who that God is, you don't know Jesus. And if the Holy Spirit that dwells within you, if He's really the Holy Spirit and you're really born again, you will acknowledge freely that your God is the God of Jacob. Your God's the God of Isaac, and your God is the God of Abraham. You'll acknowledge that. And that's proof positive of the one you belong to. A finished transaction's finished, it's sealed, and it's been done. And, uh, and there's nothing that's going to change that. When the Lord Jesus on the cross at Calvary said, It is finished, he meant what he said. It is finished. Now I'm going to show you something. I only have a few minutes left. <clears throat> I was in Galatians the other night, and some of this stuff starts jumping out at me. And uh, turn over here to Galatians with me. Uh, okay, chapter 2, verse, four, verse 1. Get that in one hand in chapter number 1, verse 6. Now watch this carefully. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another what? Which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, now this is the anathema, 
But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Right? All right. Now look at verse 2 of chapter 2. I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation. Now you got reading this thing, and you start reading, continue reading on in through the second chapter. And you get into the third chapter. And you get into the fourth chapter, and the fifth chapter. And you finally finish up with the book of Galatians. And you say to yourself, what, what's the gospel that Paul's talking about here? Hold your place here and turn to 1 Corinthians 15. All right. He says, I'm going to declare you the gospel. Verse 1. Verse 3, I delivered unto you, first of all, that we received Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and then he goes on to the proof. All right, now here's, what, here's my point. Where's that at in Galatians? You see, he had never jumped off of the pages at me like that before. And Lord only knows how many times I've read Galatians. I read Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians weekly. I read Hebrews weekly. Then other passages of the Bible. The heart of the Pauline epistles, the Pauline revelation. It is Pauline revelation. Is the gospel in, in Galatians? Absolutely. I'm not trying to pit one against another. I'm trying to make you think. In 1 Corinthians 15, he spells it out. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried, according to the Scriptures. Rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Amen. Okay, but it doesn't spell it out like that in Galatians. It doesn't spell it out like that in Galatians. But he says, I came to you, to, to, to Peter, James, John. He mentions them, Cephas, he calls him there, which were, which were of note. You know, they were important. He said, it doesn't matter to me one way or another. God's no, no, no respecter of persons. But he said, I wanted to come to them, and he said, I wanted to compare that gospel that I preach so that uh, I had not run in vain. Now, when he mentions about running in vain, he's not talking about doubt in his mind about the veracity of what he was preaching. No question. He got that by revelation. He was preaching the gospel. He wanted to make certain that he wasn't in conflict with the leadership in Jerusalem, Cephas, James, and John, Peter, James, and John. So what's going on here? What's, what's, what's he doing? What's going on here? You know what he, got, you know what he does? Here's what he does in, uh, in Galatians. I'm going to run out of time, sure as a world. Look at verse number 16. Galatians chapter number 2, verse 16, and I'll make my point. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. He just told you that there's something inside you that is compelling you to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ to justify you cleanse you, forgive you, bring you right standing before God. That's what justified means. All of this is working inside you. He didn't spell it out in Galatians because in the book of Galatians, Judaizers has, it had entered in and were teaching the people that they had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Well, instead of just coming up and spelling out the gospel like he did in 1 Corinthians 15, he reached right down into their heart and looked at them and said, I want to know what makes you think you're justified. How do you know you're right with God? What are you really trusting? 
as your salvation. And of course, there's a whole lot more he says later on. Here's the acid test, and I'll give it to you and I'll shut up this morning. The acid test is not a bunch of theological stuff you got up here in your head. Not a bunch of Christology, and Christology is all good. Pneumatology, hamartiology, and all these disciplines, they're all good. But that's not salvation. Salvation is what's going on in your heart. Are you really trusting one to cleanse you, justify you, forgive you, make you right before God, bear you into his presence on his own, in his own heart? Is that what you're trusting? Or is it some doctrinal statement, some, some, some catechism that some church has given you, and you agree with everything they've put down on a piece of paper? That's not going to do you any good. It's what's in your heart. And that's how he made the difference between the Judaizers in the book of Galatians and the real believers. Of course, you know the issue. He said, who hath bewitched you? You started in the spirit, now you're justified in the flesh. Of course, you're not justified in the flesh. He used that as a rhetorical statement. You think you are, and you're not. The only way to be right with God, folks, is in the heart. And you may be carrying some religious baggage around. You may not look like a Baptist, but if that's heart is a true believer in Christ, and you really are trusting him, that's what makes you a Christian. That's what makes you a Christian. And if you yield to the power of the Holy Spirit of God, I'll bring, I believe he'll bring uniformity, a lot of uniformity into the body of Christ. If we don't have it, why don't we have it? The main reason is pride, P-R-I-D-E. People will defend their denomination in a heartbeat. They'll defend their denomination faster than they'll defend Christ. Amen. All right, let's pray. Brother Lee, dismiss it.